Good day and welcome to CIM's virtual event brought to you by the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Today, we will be talking about leading with empathy, understanding your bias and developing codes of curiosity and empathy. My name is Mary Lou Raboulis, Client Relations at CIM. Thank you for joining us this evening. Some housekeeping before we get started. If you joined with your computer audio, make sure you selected the computer audio button on your control panel. If you dialed with a traditional phone, ensure the phone button is selected. During the presentation, you will be asked to participate in some polls. Please type or select the multiple choice answers in the poll box in the control panel. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box in the control panel. The questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. And now without further ado, I'd like to present the moderator of the session, Simone Henscher. Simone is a member of CIM's Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. She is manager, Mind Technical Services for Rio Tinto based in California, and is also actively involved in the Inclusion Council at her Mind site, and is very passionate about ensuring we can all bring our best selves to work. Welcome, Simone. Thank you, Mary Lou. Welcome, everyone. Good, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, we're pleased to inform you that the presentation will be recorded and it will be available on the diversity and inclusion section of the CIM website in the coming weeks. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have uh, quite a few people joining us this evening from all over the place. So we're thrilled to have attendees from areas such as British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Quebec, Arizona, California, Washington, Peru, and Alabama, to name a few. Uh, we do have one poll question to get us started. So I'm going to have the poll pulled up and I'll have you guys answer. You should just see it come up in your screen. And so the question is, what is your knowledge on understanding your bias and developing codes of curiosity and empathy? I think the, uh, the poll will get launched. No, no, not yet. Okay. okay it's not working. Maybe. Okay, let, let me see if I can launch it. I'll try. Uh... Ah, there we go. While people are filling out the poll, I also want to recognize that today is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Um, you know, as uh, we're talking about diversity and inclusion, I think it's important to uh, remember there's still a number of women that are experiencing violence on a regular basis and uh, we need to do everything in our power to be allies to assist in uh, preventing that. Okay, I'll just give it about another five seconds and then I'll close that poll. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to introduce you all to UB. So UB Seminary is the Chief Marketing Officer and Evangelist of Interview IA. He has a clear perspective of the good, bad, and ugly of how companies are being built. The intersectionality of surviving workplace violence and his Latino background helped define that perspective. As such, he is an advocate for people's safety and happiness at work. He thrives in helping people overcome internal obstacles to help to be better humans to themselves and others. He has a passion for helping. Welcome, UB. Hi, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, oh, there we go. I'm gonna show my window here. So yeah, I'm really excited um, to be here. I've been um, lucky uh, through connections like Simone to be developing a really great relationship with the mining industry, both in the US and in Canada and so uh, just excited to talk about you know something that I truly believe can help us with a lot of things right and and 
you know, I appreciate Simone, you mentioning uh, the international, what, what today was as far as violence against women and recognizing that because I think a lot of the things we're going to talk about today um, can, can help us to, to better understand why a lot of these things happen. And it, it by no means is an excuse for that at all, but it's it helps for us to become more aware of how we think about things and, and how automatic a lot of those things are. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna hopefully demonstrate it to you and talk about some ways that we as individuals and as teams of people can um, can, can really confront and, and combat bias and use empathy to create better relationships with each other and use curiosity to learn more about each other so that we're working off of good information is really what it comes down to. So uh, where I want to start with everybody and, and while the instructions here are in Zoom, we're just going to use the chat for this. Um, but we launched something and this was brought to us by a partner of ours at work. Called, uh, her name's Nina Baliga. And she's a woman of color, South Asian, Indian, who had started her own company and, and kicked this pre-meeting exercise off with her team every day. And it's called the traffic light check-in. And it's based on the premise that we don't all bring ourselves to work or we don't come to work every single day at 100%. It's just not possible. And that can be due to anything from we just didn't get a good sleep last night or there was bad traffic in the morning. Um, hold on, I'm getting, can anybody, can, ever, can anybody else not see my screen? It's just coming up as a blank white screen, UV. Oh, that's weird. Um, let me see. There you go. I see it now. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, um, so the traffic light check-in. The the concept is based on the fact that we don't come to work every day at the same level mentally, physically. So what the traffic light check-in gives us the ability to do is to share with everyone on our team how we are doing that day. And it, it's in the form of a color. So green is, I feel great. Like I'm ready to go. I'm here to do what I need to do today to help achieve the goals of our team. Yellow means things aren't necessarily ideal right now, but, but I'm okay there is the possibility for me to shift to green at some point throughout the day uh, or not. You might stay yellow all day. And then red, red is uh, anything, right? I'm overwhelmed, I'm upset, I'm, I'm experiencing depression, um, but I still wanna be at work. And so the, the point to going around and having everyone share their color with each other is that eventually we start to learn how everybody is bringing themselves to work every day and how we as a team can really step, step up to help those who are maybe red that day. Because it's not that they don't want to participate in the end goals of the, of the team, it's just that they can't that day. So how can we help them still feel included while giving them uh, you know, tasks and responsibilities that they can take on even in a red state? Um, and so I wanted, I wanted to ask everybody here, if they could just put it in the chat, what, what color you are, um, just to get a feel for, you know, how the, how the audience is feeling today. You know, there's a lot going on in 2020. And so, um, so please feel free to throw that up in the, in the chat if that's, if you have that ability to do so. And please, you know, feel free to take this exercise and, and implement it with your teams. You know, the goal, the goal here is to help start to activate empathy within ourselves and within our teams at work um, by, by giving each other the, the opportunity to share how it is we're feeling without actually getting into the details of it. Because at the end of the day, it's not the details don't necessarily matter. It's really more about just, you know. Um, you know, it, it's just about understanding how everybody's doing and how we can help support each other. So yeah, and I think it's under question, sorry. 
So um, I'm not seeing anything, but maybe that's just on my end. Yeah, I'm seeing quite a few come here. So we've got a couple greens and we've got a lot of yellows. So um, yeah, I see a few greens and plenty, plenty yellows. Okay, perfect. Well, great. Well, thank you all for sharing. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so let's jump in. One thing, a couple things to keep in mind throughout the presentation is, you know, please stay mentally and physically present. You know, I, I do, and I'm going to ask Simone, I'm going to ask for your help in terms of participation here because I, I can't see people's answers, but I do have some some ways that I want to I want to engage the audience. Um, and so would really love you all to participate as much as you feel comfortable doing. Um, but really, it's mostly about realizing that this is a safe, vulnerable space where we're having somewhat uncomfortable conversations about who we are as people, um, but knowing that on the end of that, it, it will make us better. So we have to be honest and vulnerable with ourselves, give ourselves a little grace, keep an open mind, and lead with curiosity so that we can get to that other side where we're just acting a little bit better every single day, even though our biases still exist. Um, we, we can decide how we're going to act against those and behave towards other people. So just keep all that in mind. And let's start off with an exercise. So this is a, a level set. And it, it's meant to start to help people really clearly understand what bias is. So imagine that you're walking through the grocery store and you know, you're going down the potato chip aisle. Which one of these do you pick first? And Simone, I'm gonna have you keep me updated. Yep, will do. I'm seeing some kettle chips, some Lay's. Okay. <laughs> Lay's. The so kind of a kind of a mix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A few kettles. Okay. Well, how about this follow-up question? Which one of these is healthier for you? Looks like. Uh, it looks like a couple, most people I think kettle, a couple said okay. nothing, neither. <laughs> and uh, pretty much everybody's saying the kettle chips are healthier. Right, because it says green, it has this green organic sticker, right? Well, so here's what's interesting, right? Those, those answers came pretty quickly to us. Uh, but the thing is, if we do a little research, turn those bags around, we can see that they're pretty much the same in terms of health. So, so the first point I want to make here is this. We all have preconceived opinions about things, but they're not necessarily based on facts. They're based on experience. I grew up with Lay's potato chips in my lunchbox almost every day. So that's my preference. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that, that preconceived notion, that bias that I have towards Lay's versus Kettle, um, is, is based on truth, based on fact. So that's the first one. This one gets a little more contentious, which, uh, where do you all fall on the iPhone versus Android phone scale? Mostly iPhones, we've got an Android in there. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, and so, so here's where bias starts to get interesting and potentially dangerous because now if I ask you a follow-up question, which would be Android users, how do you describe iPhone users? Often we get things like this, right? They love status, easier to use, or they're cult members, you know? And if I turn that around and say, okay, iPhone users, what are Android users? How would you describe Android phone users? You might get techies or hipster. So what's happening here is now we're taking those preconceived opinions that we have of things and applying those to people. And, and so now we start to get into the dangerous area of unconscious bias. So for example, if we look at this group of characters and I ask you, who's the most creative in this group? We all have a pretty quick answer. For me, it, it might be the woman who has pink hair. If I ask who is the CEO in this group, we all gravitate, we all have an immediate answer. And, and so 
this is where we have to start. We have to start understanding where those immediate answers for each of us as individuals comes from. We've got to be vulnerable and honest with ourselves, and we've got to be able to reflect on where those immediate answers are coming from, what's fueling them, what's, what's driving them within us, what's triggering them. Because that, that's, that's the only way that we can really truly start to then choose how we're going to behave whenever those biases continue to pop up, because they will, we can't get rid of them. Bias is something that has helped us survive for millions of years. It's, it's also a way we learn. And that's okay. And so in that instance, what I want everybody to remember is, is that we're all biased, doesn't mean we're broken, and we're just human. That's what connects us all. And that's what's helped us survive. That's how we learn. Bias is neither positive or negative. It, it becomes such based on how we choose to behave against those. And so where we want to start is with awareness. If we can become more aware of our own biases and how they work, then we can start to change our thinking and our behavior uh, as they relate to people specifically. But this applies to lots of things like different ideas, um, places, you know, things like that. So with that, we're going to jump into really the science behind bias. How does bias work? How do our brains work? Um, to to start to to really better understand then how can we how can we take control of that process? So it starts with, and we've broken this up into um, really an equation, a four part equation, starting with information overload. We are all bombarded with so much information every single second. And if you can see here on the screen, our eyes, for those of us who have you know, the ability to see, our eyes take in more than the other four senses combined in terms of data. The problem is our brains cannot, at their basis level and automatically, cannot process all of that information. It's just not, it's not possible. You know, our brains are computers and they, they operate very similarly. And so a lot of that information gets spun out or disregarded because, again, we, our brains just don't have the capacity for processing all of it. So that, that's part one. It's just, just so much information that we're all taking in. The second part is think of this now as sort of the code that's written into our brain at, you know, from the time we're born all the way through the end of our lives. That, that creates these filters through which the little bit of data that does stick in our brains gets processed. So we have our internal drivers, uh, you know, things, you know, we, we all wanna be safe and healthy, that's driving us, we all wanna learn, we all, you know, different things, right? Um, that, those are kind of internal parameters that drive each of us as individuals. And then you have externally, uh, our families, our, our friends, where we've traveled, where we live, you know, church, school, all of these things externally around us that are also adding in different lenses and perspectives through which data gets, um, gets filtered. And even though we're all looking at the same data around us, we're all processing it differently. The third part goes back to fight or flight millions of years ago and you know again this was a this was a survival mechanism you know our brains just would immediately categorize anything that we saw as either safe or dangerous because that's what we needed to do that's what our brains needed to do to keep us alive problem is we still do that right we still do that today our brains have created this categorization and file system where uh, you know a lot of these files have maybe little bits of information but but and th and that little bit of information that gets processed from all of the data around us from that information overload gets thrown into these files and so that happens automatically right that's happening every second um, little bits of information get processed into these these different categories but and and that's that's not intentional. That is just how the brain works automatically. So there's this pattern response going on here that again is now forming, helping to form our biases. 
So th this is the third step in the in the um, equation here. The fourth step is this this concept, uncertainty equals pain. So I want to start off with an image, and if you could just throw it up in the chat, what do you see in this image? Simone, we're probably going to get some really uh, interesting answers. <laughs> Someone said head frame. A squirrel okay. on a branch. Okay. Four. A four, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. I mean, right? On a branch, animal on a branch. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so let me ask you all this: How does looking at an image like this make you feel? Confused. Confused. Yeah. Curious. Uncomfortable. It's not clear. Dismissive. <laughs> curious. So let me let me ease that. I'm going to do what the brain does. I'm going to ease that confusion for you. So what just happened is is what the brain does for us whenever the brain realizes that we're confronted with something that's uncertain. And, and where uncertainty is managed in the brain is up front here, the same place that manages emotional and physical pain. So just like when we get a cut on our hand and our body uh, launches an immediate response, the same thing happens when we're confronted with something that makes us feel uncertain, confused, fearful. The brain doesn't like that. So, and, and the brain just basic function is to associate everything with pain in that, that, you know, that uncertainty is just like physical pain. And so that's what the brain's doing. The brain is, is taking that and now saying, okay, instead of letting our brain spin out of control because we don't know what we're looking at, you know, they might actually explode if our brains didn't step in with a story to ease that pain. And that's what happens when we come up with answers to that question of what is this? You know, that's a that's our brain is saying, okay, based on the information that we have that you have in your file folders, this is a number four, because that's what makes your brain feel better and stop spinning and stop being confused. So when we put all of this together. We've got information overload constantly. We're all looking at the same data, but we're all processing the, that amount of data differently, and we're not at all processing all of it into our long-term memory banks. And then you consider the, the layers of perspective and lenses through which the little bit of data gets processed through. That's what starts to define individually for us what our biases how we'll behave against our biases. Then you've got the, the limited processing power, the, the immediate categorization of things, the simple categorization process that automatically happens in our brains with the little bit of information that gets through. And then you've got that driver through which our brains now tell us false certainties. They create these unconscious biases to ease that pain. And that's what's happening. So at a very basic automatic level, this is what happens every day. This is what how our unconscious biases are created. And, and so now that we know that, right, now that we have a basic understanding of how our brains work, it's, it's on us now to really start to dig in and understand what, number one, what triggers those biases for us? What, what is what has caused that going back, you know, creating our own bias story, right? Our biography, our bias biographies of how, how come I like Lay's more than Kettle or vice versa? Where, where did that come from? We've got to start to do that and really start to self-reflect and understand so that we can then start to game our own system by filling our file folders consciously and intentionally with with better data like we've got to teach ourselves to process information more information into our long-term memory and, and categorize those very intentionally 
because that's what's going to tell our stories. And the only way we can tell ourselves better stories is if we know more. If we know more about people who we don't know anything about previously or places we've been. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I know sometimes it can sound very, you know, matter of fact or common sense, but but when we apply it to this concept of, of understanding our biases and where our biases come from and how they just work automatically, you know, we really start to see the importance of the more you know, the more we can learn. And that's where curiosity comes in. Curiosity, instead of leading with judgment, right, instead of leading with these preconceived opinions and notions of things and people, let's lead with questions. Let's ask more questions. It's okay. That's okay. There, there's nothing. There, there's nothing that says we shouldn't ask more questions of each other or of of things. That will lead us down the path of making better decisions by driving with less judgment, by being more curious. And that's the impact of of this work, uh, and just that simple awareness and understanding of where our own biases come from. So that's part one. Uh, are there any questions? I'm gonna turn my light on because I think it's getting dark in here. Hold on. But does anybody have any questions so far? I don't see anything yet. Okay. All right, well, we'll, we'll keep kind of going through and if they come up, uh, we, we'll, we'll all be, we'll, um, have time at the end for, for Q&A. So um, if you feel more comfortable waiting, great. Um, but I wanna jump into empathy now. Empathy, empathy is really, uh, think of empathy as kind of the, the, the driver and activator of, of understanding our biases, of bias awareness. Empathy is what is um, the spark through which we can now create better relationships with each other, especially with people who we don't know. And we'll talk about that. So quick question to everybody. How many of you think that either you have empathy or you don't? Like it's a very binary thing, one, zero. Does anybody think that at all? Or what, what, how do you, what do you think? Do you think people um, have little bits of empathy? Do you think it's a spectrum? Like, what do you all think? Yeah, a couple answers coming through. So uh, multiple levels, it's a spectrum. Yeah. Um, yeah, curious, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Point of too curious, some have more than others, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, everybody's right. Um, you know, we believe that everyone has empathy, even uh, even sociopaths or psychopaths. Some people have brought that up before. And, and here's why. It starts with this concept of mirror neurons. So again, going back to millions of years, survival. How did we survive? Physically in our brains, these mirror neurons exist, and they're designed to help us create an immediate connection with somebody by giving us the ability to quickly understand and mimic the, the facial expressions or the you know the, the feeling that somebody else is presenting to us so you know as cavemen we had never met anybody else before and all of a sudden we run up against somebody else and so this prevented us this this physical function prevented us from killing each other right away because we were able to create a connection so there is a biological basis for empathy, and this is still at play today. You know, when we watch movies and we feel ourselves, um, you know, welling up, you know, or becoming sad because somebody on the screen is sad and crying, that those are our mirror neurons at work. That's empathy at work, and that's the point. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna activate your mirror neurons. Here we go. I apologize. You don't have to admit to yawning. Um, you can maybe leave that in the survey at the end. <laughs> but but that's that. Those are our mirror neurons at work. Yawning is a great example of that. So at its core, what is empathy? Empathy is when a friend or a coworker, let's say, comes into our office or you know back in the day or jumps on a Zoom with us and they're angry. You know, how many of you just 
give yourselves your, you know, raise of a hand, feel yourself start to get angry, right? We do that. That's, that's what's going on. That's empathy. We feel that starting to well up within us as well. And, and there's a reason for that. And I think a lot of people don't understand why that's happening originally, but it does. It's the same thing when we, you know, we're in a room, a crowded room again back in the day, but when somebody comes in and they're very happy and joyous, everybody else starts to feel that, right? We kind of understand that. So we're gonna walk through the spectrum that a lot of you mentioned in your answers of empathy. There's three levels, cognitive, affective, and compassionate. Um, and, and this is a spectrum through which we operate every single day. But again, we're acting very automatically. So now we're going to learn about how we can take control so we can consciously navigate this spectrum to be more effective. So starting with cognitive, how many of you have uh, ever said this? We've all said this, right? I know exactly how you feel. Well, so what, what's actually going on here? So person on the right of the screen here has an arrow in them. Person on the left is like, you know what? I know exactly how you feel. But what's going on is the person on the left who said that, what they're actually doing is going back into their memory of a time that they had an arrow stuck in them and layering then or even replacing the experience of their friend who's going through that right now with that memory so by saying i know exactly how you feel you're actually taking a very logical approach it's still meant to create a connection with someone but it's it's a connection based on you it's not about them in this case it's a very logical response in terms of empathy and and it's helpful but it's it's not getting at actually feeling what the other person is feeling and understanding what they are going through this is very logical this is very i know how i remember going through that exact scenario now this has just become about me right um you know everybody hears about one uppers you know oh well i have a better story than that you know that's that's cognitive empathy at play so the next level up is affective empathy. So affective empathy is the feeling aspect of this. So it's the ability for us to look into a crowd of people, even people we don't know, but understand what they're feeling, what they're going through. It's when we're walking through a coffee shop and we see someone else drinking a cup of coffee, our brains actually fire as if we're drinking a cup of coffee. So there's a direct connection there of understanding in our brains that makes us feel that feeling. We know exactly what that feels like to have a cup of coffee. We know exactly what it feels like to see a couple walking in the park holding hands, right? Or to see someone ice skating or something. We know what that is. And so affective empathy is that connection of feeling that also gives us the ability to react if that's what the scenario calls for so going back to our friend with an arrow in them affective empathy now so now i've i've remembered have been in being in a similar scenario but now i can see and experience the feeling that my friend's going through the pain the the anguish the fear so now my reaction would be to call 911 it's also what happens when babies are crying and we know that they need a bottle, they need to lay down for a nap, they need a changing. We can provide that because of affective empathy, because we know what that feels like. We understand that. But again, affective empathy is still a reaction. Um, and it's still, you know, it, it, it gives us that ability to react, but, it, it, but it's still just very much a reaction because we we still have to feel that feeling within ourselves of what somebody else is going through so where we really want to get to as as often as we can and of course it's dependent on the situation but where we want to get to is this place of compassionate empathy so let's use the the scenario of um the person our friend with an arrow in them so we've gone through cognitive empathy right i'm replacing their 
current present experience with my memory of having the same thing happen to me. Moving into now, I'm feeling what they're feeling. I'm, I'm feeling maybe even a little bit the physical pain that they're going through and the anguish and the fear um, so that I can react, but I'm still letting that fear bubble up and take over me to this level of compassionate empathy where, okay, they're hurt. I can see that. This is not about me. I can understand that they're probably scared right now. Um, and so I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to remain logical. I'm, I'm not going to let those feelings of fear overtake me. And I'm going to figure out how I can, how I can really help them. And it's not driven by my own fear. It's not driven by my own memories of what I tried to do. It's driven by this logical place of, of understanding to a point where, okay, I can help them now. And so, it, you know, this level is hard. It, this level is like working muscles, like building muscles. It, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to do it. But it's where people, for example, team leads, where, where leaders within organizations need to get to because very often people, employees want to come and have a conversation with their manager, um, but how many times does that conversation turn ugly because everybody's now angry in the room, if that's the scenario, and now the manager is becoming defensive because they think maybe they're being attacked by the, the, the employee because they let that anger overtake them. As opposed to that manager being able to step back, understand that their employee or their team member is going through something, they're very angry, and logically thinking, okay, how can I help this person get better? So if we look at this in kind of graph form, this really helps helps us to now start to intentionally figure out how we're going to navigate this on a daily basis. We put compassion in there because compassion is a word that gets thrown around quite a bit. Um, but compassion on this scale, right, is when we donate to a cause, for example. We want to help. We have a high desire to help that cause. But we don't necessarily want to connect at the feeling level with anybody who's affected by cancer, for example. That's compassion. But it, it's not the, that willingness to feel what people who are affected by cancer are feeling is not there. But we want to help. So that, that's compassion. So that's why it's on here. We navigate this all the time. Affective empathy, for example, the reason why it's a high willingness to feel but a low desire to help is like if somebody close to you loses a family member and we're at the funeral, you know, we want to be there because we want to support them and we want to, we want to feel those feelings and understand those feelings. But there's not much we can do to help, right? I mean, we can't bring back that person. So affective empathy is very powerful in a scenario like that. It's also really important because, you know, a lot of people feel more than others, empaths. Um, and so it's, it's important for us to realize as friends, as family members, as leaders, that we need to give ourselves a little bit of grace and time to escape for a second and take care of ourselves because we can't do this 24-7. It literally is physically draining. It's an energy drain to try to navigate this constantly. Um, so we've got to take care of ourselves in order to be able to come back into the spectrum and be more effective. So just realize that, that that's okay to do. We've got to take care of ourselves. Okay. So, Newbie, I have um, one, it's not a question per se, but it's a comment that you might just talk to. Um, so it says, compassionate empathy requires intercultural competence. That is the key ingredient to function effectively and efficiently. So I don't know if you wanted to talk to intercultural competence. Yeah, I mean, yeah, intercultural, cultural competencies. I mean, that, that goes back to curiosity and knowledge, right? I think, you know, that the, the only way that compassionate empathy can be truly effect is, effective is if we understand what our current limitations are from a bias perspective and from a knowledge perspective, 
and go and learn because absolutely then the more knowledge I have about someone, uh, you know, let's say it is an employee of mine and they're from the black community, right? And, and everything that's been going on in the United States around Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, the, the history there of racism in this country, you know, that that's, that, that's a scenario many white Americans don't understand. They can't, they don't have that history, right? So to your point, we've got to learn first. We've got to go learn and understand about that history, about what's happening so that we can be more effective at that level of compassionate empathy. So it's a great point. Um, and it ties directly back to curiosity and, and understanding our biases so that we can then make a conscious decision on, okay, so I know I have this bias, but now I know that I need to go learn more. You may also decide that, you know what, I don't want to go learn more. That, that's okay. That's that's a conscious decision that you've made, um, and that's what we end up doing with our biases is is really going back and either because again bias is neither good or bad. So some of them are good, so we can uh, justify and confirm them, or decide that yeah this one isn't necessarily based on truth. So I'm going to go and fill fill in the gaps and and learn more so that I can dismiss that bias or or behave positively when that bias pops up. Um, so no, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great point. So now where empathy starts to play out in terms of our relationships with people and how we're interacting with each other, particularly um, at work, for example, is this concept of empathy circles. So if we think about ourselves in the middle and then these kind of concentric circles or groups of people moving outwards, and then if we think about empathy as a flashlight. So empathy is a finite resource. The flashlight is brighter, you know, closer to me, right? So the people closer to me are receiving my empathy the most, and I'm receiving the most from them. And then as we get further and further out, the flashlight dims, and, and we don't necessarily have as much empathy or understanding for groups who are further out. Right. And so that's we have to start defining this and understanding this for ourselves, because the next step is, can I then shine my flashlight onto a group of people? Can I take that brighter part of the flashlight? Can I move to a group who's normally been further out away from me and sh give them more empathy because they need it? Because the people who are close to me are taken care of. And that's what we have to figure out for ourselves. And a lot of that plays out in this concept of in-group versus out-group. So going back to middle school, right? This is how it played out. This is how it started to play out in our lives. We go into the lunchroom, we get our tray of food, and then we turn around and we, we decide, okay, where am I gonna sit? And so this is where in-groups and out-groups started to really have a true impact on our lives because do we go sit with a group of people who we don't identify with, who we don't have anything in common with, or did we go sit with the people, like the kids in our neighborhood I grew up with, and yeah, we, we all think alike, we all laugh at the same things, we all like the same things, maybe we even look a lot alike together. So yeah, I'm gonna go over there, because that's more comfortable. That, that's, what's, that's what happens, right? That's what happens at work. That's where we see um, hiring trends end up going, right? We hire like for like because we get that. That person, that candidate who went to my school or we grew up in the same city or they're my friend, like I'm going to hire them because that makes me feel comfortable. That's my brain saying, yeah, let's go with that choice. That's, that's the bias there. That's the story that's going to calm my uncertainty and confusion about this candidate over here who doesn't look like me who has a weird name, right? Like things like that. That's how, what that's what's going on in our brains. That's what's going on based on in-group, out-group dynamics. In this scenario here, a lot of diversity initiatives have played out this exact same way in that we have a group of Batmen and all of a sudden as an organization, we decide that we need to hire more diverse candidates onto this team of superheroes. We're gonna hire Spider-Man. But what happens, what often happens is the Batman then say, hey, Spider-Man, you've got to start dressing like us and using uh, our same 
crime fighting tools and, and you've got to sound like us and you've got to fight crime just like us. There's this assimilation going on. So because of how in-groups and out-group, in-group and out-group dynamics work, sure, we may open up our in-group from time to time, but then there's this, this aspect of assimilation that starts to occur that's not accepting of the true diversity that Spider-Man can bring to a team of superheroes. And this is a dynamic that plays out constantly. This is what drives our interactions with people. And again, going back to you know, the, the, the biological basis for a lot of these things, there is a, a hormone called oxytocin. Um, it's also known as the love hormone or the cuddle hormone. It's what strengthens the bond between a mother and a child, for example. It creates this idea of favoritism between two people. Equally, on the opposite side, it creates and strengthens divide between two people. And what we've seen through neuroscience studies is that the only thing dividing those two people is one piece of criteria. And very often, we're easily manipulated into what that criteria is. So that criteria could change. So I'll give you an example. You've got sports teams, rival sports teams. And, you know, for, for us in Colorado, it's like the Broncos versus the Raiders. We hate Raiders fans, right? We see a Raiders jersey, we just hate them. But what happens when you take away those jerseys? You have the same people. So all of a sudden that one dividing criteria is gone. And we have sports fans. We have fans who love their teams, who like to go to games, tailgate, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's what's going on automatically is we're making these decisions about who we feel comfortable with and want to hang out with who we want to hire based on one criteria and who we don't so that's why you end up with scenarios like this and we've all seen this sort of scenario play out but it does it's it's not just you know relegated to middle-aged white guys it can be anybody because again as human beings this is how we're operating we want to feel comfortable. We want to surround ourselves with people who make us feel comfortable. And so unless we learn to, to, to game that system, to take control of that system, to be more curious about different types of people and what they can offer to our team, to my life, um, and if we don't navigate our biases in a better way, we're going to continuously end up in these this, the same scenarios that we end up with, just like for like, um, and not expanding our cultural competency to be able to interact and accept and redefine our in groups with people and who can bring themselves as who they are, as who they are, right? Their true authentic selves. We can redefine to get away from this roadblock of what a truly diverse group of people can accomplish. So if we can get to a point where, you know, our, our works and our team start to look like this, right? It doesn't matter who you are. We're all, we're, it doesn't matter, but we're all able to bring our true authentic selves to that. Then, then we really truly start to see some amazing things. And what we start to see is team cohesion. We start to see driven by uh, awareness of, of, of our biases, driven by curiosity and driven by our ability to navigate this spectrum of empathy. We can build a better team. We can build a better group of friends and family and community. Um, we also can be better in our roles. Uh, whether that's our roles at home or our roles at work. We can be better leaders and we believe everybody can be a leader in this sense. It just, it takes, it doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to have a certain title to, to truly be able to have an impact driven by your ability to drive with empathy, right? And build better relationships and be more curious. And ultimately, tying this back to work, like we can build better products and services when we have teams of people who bring their true authentic selves to work every single day. And it's a mix of people and experiences and, and backgrounds and cultures. We will build better products and services that, that everyone can see themselves using or wanting to be a part of, right? We can build a workplace where anybody can see themselves 
in the people who are currently working there. Any candidate can see themselves potentially having success there. So, real, so to close it out, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, we all have empathy, we all have bias, and these two things are really the biggest drivers for how we behave towards each other. And, and so now, with the, our awareness of our biases, where those come from, what triggers them, and, and how to better and consciously navigate that spectrum of empathy, we can start to understand how we consciously communicate with others, verbally and non-verbally. That's sort of the next step in the journey is to think about how I communicate. I use my hands a lot, right? What does that say about me? What am I communicating with my hand gestures versus what I'm saying? I try to align them, but sometimes our facial expressions are perceived as a different message than what I'm saying. Our posture, open posture versus closed posture, all these things tie into how do we, how can we create a place even just within a conversation between two people, how can we create a more inclusive bubble or a more inclusive team or a more inclusive place of work by understanding these concepts? Okay, so let's open it up, Simone, to some questions. I know we have a few minutes left, so I want to make sure okay. if anybody has questions. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open one quick poll. Um, okay. while people are answering their questions. Oh, uh, it's not hey, letting me. I think I need to get out. Okay, so populated the poll and if people can just um, put their questions into the uh, question box, please. So I'm going to ask one question um, while people are filling that out, just to get um, give you a few minutes to think. So my question is this, UB, and I uh, um, I recognize that my own unconscious bias is going to play a factor in this. But when I recognize in other people what I perceive to be some unconscious bias going on, um, how do we engage and open up a conversation um, to someone who may not even be familiar that they that they carry this bias at that or that they they're basically um thinking from a place of um bias yeah i mean that's a fantastic question you know a lot of it a lot of it honestly starts with creating a, a common understanding of, of a lot of these things you know so that this is this is why it works great in, in a work environment because you know when organizations all go through this type of training they now all have a common playbook from which to understand these concepts. So it, it, it can become easier to say, hey, did you, did you recognize that, you know, that what you just said could be, you know, could be considered a microaggression or do you, you know, why did you say that? I think in general, the best way to combat that is with the question, you know, is, is let's, is ask a question back. And I think that's, that's a much better way than, than say, you know, making a, a judgment or making an assumption that that person, you know, what was purposefully making a bias again or saying or doing something that could be considered a bias, right? Let's ask, a, just ask, you know, hey, why, why did you, why do you think that? Why do you think that that's true? What, what, where does that come from? What's that based on? Because that's, again, most of the time people aren't aware that that bias exists, right, within themselves. So I think that the best way to start is is from a curiosity perspective and feeling comfortable enough to be able to an, you know ask a question to get okay, down that. You. Yeah. Okay, got, got another one. Um, so how do you engage someone who's angry and move toward compassion, empathy, rather than mirroring the anger? That I mean, and, and that's where that level of empathy is so hard, right? Because you know where it starts. It starts with so as you feel that anger bubble up inside of you, understanding why that is. And, and the basic understanding is, it's not necessarily that you're getting angry, it's that you're reflecting the other person's anger. So it's it's not necessarily your anger. And, and I think that's a big piece of that puzzle to understand. 
because people just think they're getting angry and then they become defensive and that's the natural progression. But what's happening there is you're getting angry and defensive because you're reflecting back that other person's anger. So if we can understand within ourselves that that's not our anger, then we now quickly can get away from that and step into that level of compassionate empathy where you know, we can step back and say, you know what, okay, I, I hear where you're coming from. I want to understand more about why you're angry. Can we talk about that? So we've got to sort of break ourselves out of that cycle, realizing that we're just mirroring their anger. It's not our anger. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, any, yeah. any other, anybody else want to send through another question? Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more questions come through. Um, uh, of course, uh, we're always open for more questions after the fact. If anyone wants to uh, send us a note at the DIAC or CIM. Uh, so I just want to thank you again, Yubi, for sharing your time with us this evening or this afternoon, depending on where people are. Um, just the more we continue to talk about these um, topics, the more we can all move toward a higher level of empathy um you know we're we're moving the needle here one of these conversations at a time and i just really appreciate your passion for for what you're doing and sharing that with us um i'm just going to tell um our audience that we do not have a talk for december we've left december off for um people to enjoy some time um at home over the holidays and uh we will come back in January, and I think we're going to have a fireside chat in January, and we'll continue the conversations on diversity and inclusion. Uh, for those of you in the US who do celebrate, um, have yourself a good Thanksgiving weekend, and for the rest of you, have yourself a fantastic rest of the week. Thank you for sharing your evening. Bye, everybody. Bye.